cover <laughs> my, my friend, Dr. Steve Dottel. Thank you very much, Chris. I, was, I wasn't a drill sergeant, so can you hear me? Where is it? It's on the floor. <laughs> Too many microphones. One, one for YouTube and can you hear me now? Yes. Good. So it's a pleasure to be here. I want to thank um, Mark Spitzer, the 46 restaurant, Mark's sitting over there, for providing the wonderful food. Uh, this is a great restaurant. Sadly, it's only open Thursday, Friday, and Saturday nights for dinner, Sunday for brunches, but it's an interest, interesting place to come. This was a former uh, uh, furniture store. The floors, the doors, everything were saved when they renovated it. The food is uh, cooked by Johnson & Wales chefs, trained chefs. It's a first-class restaurant. If you haven't tried it, thank them uh, by coming back after trying their hors d'oeuvres. Um, but again, thank you, Mark, for, for helping with that. Um, I'm part of the Nutrition Research Institute. Uh, we're part of UNC Chapel Hill, but we're located right here in Kannapolis. We have one of those beautiful buildings on the campus. Uh, we have about a hundred people working at the Institute right now and I'm currently recruiting for three or four more faculty members and their research teams. Uh, our most recent uh, hire came from University of Wisconsin-Madison. We got her to move here. She's a professor of nutrition, world famous for her work in how alcohol affects the development of the brain, fetal alcohol syndrome, um, and getting her to come uh, was great. She's uh, recognized by the NIH as uh, has received a merit award, which means she gets grant, a grant without having to write a proposal. <laughs> Since only 10% of the proposals are funded, that's a real honor. Uh, and in any event, we're doing very well. I invite you to visit if you haven't learned more about the Institute. And this is our Appetite for Life series. And in the past, we conducted Appetite for Life as a um, more lecture style. That now we wanted to make it a little more informal, so I'm going to talk from a few slides because a professor mm -hmm. can't manage without slides to talk from. Uh, but. I hope you'll interrupt and ask questions. And I, and I made it pretty short so we'd have the rest of the time sort of for open house questions. I, I've got a couple other faculty members here are grabbing free food, so I'll make sure they have to work for it and answer some of your questions. So um, let me start. I'm, I'm not going to really tell you what to eat today. I'm going to rather tell you what this new field of personalized nutrition or precision nutrition is and where it's going and why it's the next frontier in nutrition. Uh, so we know that people are different, but nutrition has been a field in which we assume everybody's the same and tell them all the same thing. Eat less, exercise more, don't eat fat, watch your cholesterol, but really nothing terribly customized to the individual. And yet, we know when we measure people that they can be quite different. I'll step back here so I'm out of the way of some of the people over there. They can be quite different in, in how they uh, break down food, absorb food, use it, and what their nutrition needs to be. Sorry. So one of the reasons we're different has to do with our genetics. Now, I know all of you are right up to date on how genes work. Uh, it's changing so fast that uh, I, I really don't, can't keep up with it. But I'm going to simplify it to give you an idea that you've got a large number of genes, probably 20 to 30,000 genes. Some of them are coding for 
a product, a protein that you make. And the alphabetic code of your genes determines how that protein is constructed and put together. Some of them don't code for proteins, but rather code for uh, things that regulate how the other genes work. So they're like the stoplights and switches on a train station. They're the, what we used to call junk genes five years ago aren't junk. They were put there by nature to do very important things. We just didn't know what they were doing. And now we're realizing that what they're doing is they're the traffic police, making sure the right genes are turned on and off. But I'm going to talk about now these genes that make these proteins. There are four letters in the genetic code. And by using those four letters, we can code for hundreds of thousands of different proteins. So each gene can make a different protein product because it has a different code of alphabetic uh, of letters. But those letters aren't the same for everybody. When we sequenced the human genome, we thought we'd have the answer, and we spent a lot of money at the NIH sequencing the human gene. We thought we'd be able to tell everybody why diseases occur and what's going on. But what we found was actually that everybody in this room has about 50,000 different spellings in some of their genes. So each of you has about 50,000 of your 20 to 30,000 um, genes. You have 50,000 spelling errors in those 20 to 30,000 genes. So you probably have one or two spelling errors per gene. They're not errors, they're just spelling differences. And when you have a spelling difference, sometimes that spelling difference results in a different structure for the protein being made because the code says to put it together a little differently, a little looser, a little tighter, have a loop over here and another person doesn't make the loop because they didn't put their protein together the same way because their genetic code is slightly different. So with these spelling differences, I'll call them errors, but these differences, um, we, some of those proteins we make just don't work as well. They, they aren't as fast. They don't grab on to what they have to grab on to as tightly. And so we become a little inefficient. Nutrition is really a lot of pathways, highways, that the things you eat have to go down to be converted to energy or to be converted to the structures of your cells. And each of those pathways involves many genes, many of the proteins that help the pathway to move along. And if you have an inefficiency, you're going to be a little slower or need a little more of something to get it to the amount you need to be healthy. So when these genes have these variants, sometimes they're going to have roadblocks in metabolism. You're going to not be able to convert A to B, and so you'll be different from your husband or your neighbor and need more or less, and we'll talk about that. Besides having those spelling differences in your genes, then we can also have differences in how your genes were tuned. So at early life, when we're in the womb and in very young children in our first thousand days or so, the tuning of your genes, whether they're turned on or off, can be reset. And it's done by adding a little mark to the gene that says this gene should be turned on, this gene should be turned off. After that first early life period, you faithfully copy those settings for the rest of your life. And so if you were born poorly nourished, you reset some of your genes to make you a little more efficient at managing calories, wasting a little less. And that's good for you if your rest of your life you're always challenged by not having enough food. But if later in life you suddenly are being offered all the food you can eat, your early life settings now become a disadvantage because you retuned your genes and your metabolism to be more efficient and it never shuts off. 
you copy that for the rest of your life. And that area, those settings are called epigenetics. And like everything in life, it, it's one more complication in understanding uh, what, what you're gonna, how you're going to be different from one another. I can look at the spelling of your genes, and now I have to look at how these switches are toggled on and off to be able to predict, are you going to be efficient uh, in ha managing energy or inefficient in managing energy? Are you going to be a fast metabolizer, a coffee, or a slow metabolizer? So, but now that we understand that, we can start measuring these marks. And what our institute's job is to figure out what is the dictionary, what is the catalog of which marks change which things that are important so that we can then test them in people and tell you that whether you have a problem or not. So, People, everybody in this room is different because you have many variations in your gene spelling and your early life experiences were different, so you may have reset your genes, toggled them on or off differently. And diet is the third variable because if you think about it, I might be inefficient, but I might be treating myself by taking more of that nutrient I'm inefficient at using and so I've got enough excess that I can push through the bottleneck in metabolism caused by the differences in spelling of my gene. I can, maybe I can't make something but if I have it in my diet I can take it into the diet and step around my problem. So in order to understand personalized nutrition I have to understand how your genes are spelled how you have these toggles set in early life. And I also have to know what you're eating because you may have no problems if you're eating enough to get around your metabolic inefficiency. I'll talk about that more later. So anytime I want to study that, I need to know all three. And many scientists in these studies like Nurses Health or the other big epidemiology studies that you read about all the time often don't collect one of those items, so it's hard to say why people are different. Now sometimes these inefficiencies cause a health problem. Maybe make your liver accumulate extra fat and make you have trouble with insulin and diabetes. So some subset of this entire group of inefficiencies that you have may be important enough that they are really associated with the disease and the others may be important, but we may not recognize that you've got a problem because you don't develop a disease from them. You just are inefficient and um, might be why your vitamin B12 levels are a little low when your doctor checks them, but we don't see you as having a big problem yet. And as I said, diet can be changed so that we could bypass many of these mistakes. And so part of the idea of personalized nutrition is if I knew you were inefficient at metabolizing a vitamin, I could say you need to be more careful and eat more of that <coughs> nutrient than another person who doesn't have that inefficiency or that problem in their metabolism. Now today, what's made all this possible is, is that it's pretty cheap to check the spelling of your genes. I can today look at 2.5 million of the possible alternative spellings that you have in your genes on a, from a little blood sample and a $150 test, about the same price as doing the cholesterol on a patient. And that's gene chip. And we're in the range in the maybe five years, instead of doing all these chips, we'll just send your DNA through a sequencer, just like they did when they sequenced the human genome for a million dollars a person. Now we're down to a thousand dollars a person and when it gets to about hundred fifty dollars we'll throw away these chips and just get every gene spelling that you have. Because I'm only looking at 2.5 million misspellings but you could have 10 million different spellings. These are the 2.5 million most popular on the hit parade. <laughs> so let's say what, how could this be used? So for instance we know that among you some of you, a little more than half, are fast metabolizers of caffeine. And you have an A in the spelling of this gene. 
the other, f if let's say you're Caucasian, 32%, if you're a African American, 44% of people are slow metabolizers of caffeine, and they have a C in this gene in the liver that breaks down caffeine. So is that important? Well, what we see is, is that if you drink more than four cups of coffee a day, and you're a slow metabolizer of caffeine, you have a higher risk of getting high blood pressure and heart disease. And if you're a fast metabolizer, you don't have this risk. So some of you can tolerate four cups or more of coffee a day, and I'm sure many of you drink it. I've seen people lining up at Starbucks shaking in the morning. <laughs> Some of you are slow metabolizers. The caffeine hangs around a lot longer. You get more effect from it. But if you drink too much, it builds up, and you're now at risk for developing high blood pressure and heart attacks. There's another gene that has to do with whether you get a buzz from caffeine. It's not in the liver. It's in the brain. And some people have a, a spelling that makes that receptor for the buzz from caffeine, very sensitive, and you're the people who have a couple cups of coffee and can't sleep for five days, and the other people have an alternate spelling of that buzz receptor, and they can drink a lot of caffeine, and they just don't turn it on, and they don't get insomnia and whatever, jittery and everything else. So the way you feel from caffeine, plus the, how fast you metabolize it, are all controlled by genes and the proteins they make. And you could find out today if you can tolerate more or less coffee. Now, I don't need a gene test for that, because you know it by just drinking the coffee. Are you a person who is very sensitive or can drink t needs tons of coffee just to stay happy? Folic acid is a vitamin. You've all heard about that vitamin. Women should be taking it before they get pregnant because it's very important for the early development of the baby's spinal cord and brain. If it's not there, they develop, the babies have birth defects of the spinal cord and brain. So we put it in all the cereals and all the grain products in the United States right now and fortify everybody in order to reach those women. Now, some people have, uh, this is a gene, a gene in the metabolism of that vitamin, and people who have one of these variant spellings, and again, you have two copies of every gene, so you could have one spelled n in the normal way and one spelled in the different way, right? Or you could have two spelled in the different way. Uh, uh, you can see how many people in the population have these different spellings, about half have a variant in the spelling, and they need about 10% more of this vitamin to get the same effect as a person who doesn't have those changes in spelling or misspellings, okay? So I could tell you from a gene test, should you be more careful in taking folic acid or not? And it isn't worth spending $150 to tell you you could drink more coffee or you should take more folic acid because it's a couple pennies you could do it. But if our catalog gets big enough that I can tell you 500 things about your metabolism that you should be paying attention to, then it's worth doing that test and guiding your nutrition based on that. And I think right now we have a catalog nearing 150 things that we can demonstrate. We know what they mean. I think in a year or so we'll have 500 things, and then I think it'll become worthwhile in practice for every physician or dietitian to do a gene test and then tell you custom-made advice about where you have sensitivities, deficiencies, or maybe need to eat a little less of something. So that's the understanding of where we're going. Whoops. I don't know what I just did. I just crashed. Well. <laughs> Now, I don't know if it was the same slide too long or it was they just banned football, uh, basketball finals in the state and they're upset about it.
No, there's something wrong with that slide. In any event, I don't need it right now because it's mainly, yes, I do need it. I'm just going <laughs> to, what I'm going to do is skip by it. Sorry for the. Scott's gone out there. Yeah, unfortunately, this one always happens. I don't know. It's the projector connection that's going awry. Yeah, it's got a misspelling. So in any event, I'll talk through it because it's an informal talk. You're going to try, Brooke, to get, oh, it's up there now. Hold on. Let's see if I can. It crashes every time I go up. Oh, there it goes. Good. Sort of. OK. So. As I said, the Nutrition Research Institute, which is the second building across the way there, that this is one of the things we focus on, building this catalog and proving why one person is different from another in a specific area so that we can then develop software that your physician could use. They put the, your gene chip results in there, and out it will spit. Uh, recommendations for how you should eat, a much better way to do it. We study diet and genes in relation to brain development, dementia, cancer, gout, fetal alcohol, fatty liver right now, muscle loss with aging. In, in the muscle thing, interesting, we're talking to the Army. Um, it turns out that uh, when they get uh, recruits into the Army, and for the special services, a good number of them, about a quarter, when they go through basic training and heavy exercise, start to have their muscles break down. A large leakage of, of, of a marker from their muscle appearing in their blood, and they have to stop their exercising and boot them out of boot camp because um, they have some problem when they exercise too severely in breaking down their muscles. And we found a spelling difference in the metabolism of a nutrient that makes people do that every time that nutrient is low in their diet. And if you give them a lot of that nutrient, they don't break down their muscles. So we're asking with the Army, can we show that these recruits that they're having a problem with have this exact problem or not? 10% of people in Kannapolis, when we studied it in our institute, with non-army people but random volunteers had this spelling difference and when we took this nutrient down in their diet started to break their muscle down when we put the nutrient back in they stopped so that gave us the idea to go to um, uh, Fort Bragg and Womack Hospital and say you've got this problem would you like to see if it's occurring there and they're visiting in October to talk about that as a research idea that the DOD might fund here. So that's how you get ideas from finding this stuff every day. So let me. I'm curious what the, the nutrient was. It's going to be this one that I'm oh, going to talk to you I'm about. Sorry. So I, no, it's fine. I, so, so what I'm world famous for is I discovered that you have to eat this nutrient called choline. When I went to medical school, nobody knew it. Uh, when I was in graduate school, I knew that rats had to eat it, and I knew that monkeys had to eat it or they got sick. And so I said to myself, why do all the textbooks say that humans don't have to eat it? And so I said, OK, the way to do that is let's take people, put them in a research center, take this nutrient away from them. And if they need it, they're going to get sick. And if they don't need it, they won't get sick. And what we found is, is that almost all men and almost all postmenopausal women got sick. And what they developed was either 
a, a lot of fat in their liver and some liver damage. Or they develop this muscle breakdown problem that I talked to you about. And only half, a little less than half, of premenopausal women got sick. And so, look, I went to Harvard Medical School. It wasn't a big leap to say, what's the difference between premenopausal women and postmenopausal women and men? It's estrogen, right? So we went and asked whether that you can make some choline in your own liver. And the, it turns out that your ability to make choline in your liver is turned on by estrogen. If you don't have estrogen, you can't make your own supply. You have to eat it. If you do have estrogen, you can, but you need to have high enough levels of estrogen to really turn it on. And those levels are achieved in the first, second, and third trimester of pregnancy when women go from <coughs> modest levels of estrogen to very high levels of estrogen as part of being, having a baby and being pregnant. And so just at the time when they need a lot of choline to make a baby, they are turning on the ability to make choline with estrogen. And even when they're not pregnant, they're still able to make enough choline that if I take it away from them, they don't get sick from being deprived of the choline. So the women who have estrogen here are making enough choline that you don't have to worry about eating and everybody else has to worry about getting it from the food supply. And before I leave this, let me ask, so 44% of the young women still got sick when I took it away. What was wrong with them? They had estrogen. We measured it. They had fine estrogen. Why were they getting sick? Well, they had a spelling difference in the gene, the estrogen response gene for this in the liver, and they just were like men. They had the estrogen, but they couldn't respond to the estrogen. The switch was defective. And so about half of women have this spelling difference. What's fascinating is it looks like it's mainly in people who came from Europe, Caucasians. And we went to Africa. And this institute does research all over the world. I, I flew to the Gambia. I had the theory. In the Gambia, I knew they were eating about a third as much choline as we eat in the United States because they don't eat eggs, they don't eat meat, they didn't have a good supply of it. I, I was sure they were going to be in big trouble. But it turned out they were missing this spelling difference. They were all spelled so that they were completely efficient at making their own choline, and the pregnant women didn't need it. So over a long period of time, evolution must have selected against women having children who, with low choline in their diet and having a spelling error so they couldn't make their own. So over time, the group that could make it on their own dominated the population. So how did we check that? Because maybe, you know, people left Africa 50,000 years ago and made it with uh, Cro-Magnon men and women and introduced new genes and maybe it came when after they left Africa. We went to the Maasai population in Kenya that eats a lot of milk and blood as part of their tradition, very high in choline. They have all of the spelling differences that Europeans have. So they didn't have any reason to select against it because their diet was high in choline. They didn't care if women couldn't make their own. It survived. So these spelling errors uh, my, are probably, if I go to different areas of the world, are going to be different around the world. Now, an, another story uh, that our institute has worked on is uh, this story of this fish oil, DHA. Infant needed to build a normal brain. The, the, the tissue highest in this fatty acid from fish called DHA is the brain. Huge amounts get pumped into the brain to make a normal brain. And it turned out that infant formula companies made an infant formula mm -hmm. containing DHA because breast milk has some DHA in it. And when they tried it on, on children, only 15% showed an improvement in their brain function as tested by 
memory tests and whatever. And the other 85% of children couldn't care about getting more in their diet. So why were they different? And so we then went and, and asked, and what it turns out, mother can make DHA from plant sources like flax, and the gene that does this um, can either be a, fa a good gene fast at doing it or a gene with a different spelling that is very slow at doing that. And 15% of mothers have that slow gene and their babies are the ones who care about getting DHA in the infant formula because their mothers didn't supply it to them across the placenta and womb and in their breast milk. They got less, so their stores were very low, and when they got it, you could see an improvement in their brain performance. And the other 85% where mother was making enough and giving it to them, again, didn't care about the spelling difference. So again, this time it isn't the baby's genes that affect what the baby needs, it's the mother's genes that affected what the baby needs, because the mother was in charge of supplying the baby with this nutrient in very early life. So, Again, that's the kind of thing we have to think about as we develop these new tests to develop personalized nutrition. Now, personalized nutrition matches perfectly with what your doctors are doing. Your doctors now know that for certain drugs, they better give you a, um, a gene test because if you're a fast metabolizer of the drug, you're not going to build up enough levels for it to do you good. And if you're a slow metabolizer, you're going to be overdosed. And doctors know that about, for every drug, one-third of the population is underdosed, one-third is overdosed, and only one-third gets it just right. So now with these gene tests, this is a drug called warfarin. It's a blood thinner that they give to people to prevent them from having a stroke. Um, they, they're not allowed to prescribe this without doing a gene test first to, to find out if you're a fast or slow metabolizer. And the drug is sold in three doses, one, three, and five milligrams. And you match the dose to the gene test. So that's similar to the idea that we're talking about nutrition. It just happens to be for a drug. So how will it work? You're going to go to your doctor or, or dietitian. They're going to do a gene test. It's going to go on a chip. You're going to we're going to have a catalog of changes that make a difference that will be in a computer program. They'll put your stuff into a computer program and out it'll spit. You need to eat more leafy vegetables because you're inefficient at folate. You need to eat more eggs because you're not going to make your own choline during pregnancy. You can imagine that would be important. And, um, Probably there'll be a whole profession of gene-guided coaching saying, you know, uh, you should pay attention to this uh, or not pay attention to this because of your gene settings, etc. <coughs> so I think that's what the field will be and our mission here is to start enabling that by building more and more of these interesting, proven reasons to worry about your gene spelling, and I've just given you a few of the ones we're working on. So all of you probably are, are um, wondering what do your genes look like? How could you get your genes tested? And right now, um, th there are a lot of places that'll test your genes. 23andMe is a, an example, the former wives of the Google founders founded 23andMe. They'll test your genes for $200 and give you a whole sheet, the success test we do. The only problem is there's nobody who takes those and tells you what it means. Because there isn't this computer program yet that we're trying to develop and the knowledge to say. So we could probably look one by one and tell you, yes, you have the fast coffee metabolizing gene, etc. There are a few companies out that are now just doing 12 genes and from that telling you what you should do based on those 12 genes. And so the answer is, is that it's probably, we're at the stage of you could do it yourself, go get a 23andMe or equivalent uh, genotype and then look up the different uh, spelling differences that are known to make a difference and try to tell yourself. Or you could wait a few years 
and uh, then your physician will have a program that will translate it all for you um, into uh, a recommendation. But we're right at that range where the home tinkerers are doing it to themselves, getting the test done for $200 from 23andMe. You give them a sample of spit, they send you back. They, it's a very good test, it's just the exact one we do, and then uh, you, you start looking up the ones that make a difference. You could certainly look up, do you make the choline one or whatever, but it's not yet ready for your everyday physician to use. Yes? Sure. So the question was, how is this type of research going to affect diabetes? So there's two kinds of diabetes. Type 1 diabetes, which clearly is a disease in which uh, your cells in your pancreas that make insulin are missing or die out very early in life. So that's called juvenile diabetes, but sometimes we don't discover it until somebody's older. And there's the second type of diabetes, type 2 diabetes, where you have enough of these cells, but you don't have a lot of excess ability to make insulin. So when you, become, when you get, develop a lot of fat, you become obese, um, you also develop uh, resistance to the insulin, and you need more, but your s cells don't have the ability to keep kicking out more, and so you start to look like you're diabetic. And eventually, this type 2 diabetes looks the same as type 1 diabetes, not enough insulin to meet your needs. You get high blood sugar and all of the problems related to having high blood sugar. Now what could this do? Well, as I said, um, for instance, who gets fatty liver quickly? And what we found is, we, this out of our institute, my lab published a paper that I can predict from a genetic test, uh, a, a, large group of about 20 percent of the population who, as soon as they start gaining weight, will rapidly develop fatty liver compared to other people who won't. And again, it's because, again, they're inefficient at packaging up the fat in the liver and exporting it to the rest of the body, so it all builds up in the liver quickly, and it's because they have some spelling they have differences in the spelling of 20 different genes, and I can predict with 95% accuracy that they're going to have it. So what this would mean is if I want to predict who is going to be more likely to have problems with becoming mildly overweight or more overweight, a doctor could do that and then say, I have to pay more attention to you and make sure that you keep your body weight, your body fat down because you're more likely to go on to develop fatty liver, which is the precursor for getting type 2 diabetes. Does that make sense? Yes? I have two sure. When you were talking about bonus, yeah. Okay. What effect does that have on the body if you don't have enough? Okay. Okay, so let me take the first question, because I'll have forgotten it by the time I deal with the second one. <laughs> the first question was folate, and what about folate did you want to ask? I wanted to know, if you don't have enough of that, what does it look like? Okay, so the question was, the vitamin, the vitamin fo the folate, the vitamin folate, and the artificial form called folic acid, what are they important for, and if you don't have them, what happens? So first of all, what I mentioned was is women who don't have adequate folate on day 22 of their pregnancy, well before they know they're pregnant, the babies often can't close up the spinal cord. And so they have a defect in the spinal cord that when the baby's born is called spinal bifida, or more severe case would be no brain forming. So folic acid, folate, 
is extremely important for that critical step in development of rolling the a flat uh, embryo into a tube to be, start forming the baby and the spinal cord is the inside of that tube. Okay. Does it have any effect on just a regular person? So on a regular person when you're folic acid, folate deficient, you develop an anemia. You get a, fol a, a, a kind of anemia in which uh, it's not that you're short of iron, you have enough iron, because that's another cause of getting an anemia, but even with enough iron, you can't make uh, red cells properly, and you get these big red and white cells, much bigger than normal because they can't divide to make daughter cells, and you develop a type of anemia that a doctor can easily recognize as being different. It looks something like the anemia you get with B12 deficiency, so the doctor has to do a few tests to separate it, but that's the presenting symptom in, an, in a grown-up person is trouble with your red cells. Right, so folate comes from green leafy vegetables. It was named for foliage. Folic acid is not in nature. It is an artificial vitamin form that's made, but your body converts it to folates pretty quickly, and it's a penny and easy to make, so that's why they use folic acid, and that's what they spray on cereal flakes in total or in the pills that they give to everybody, or to pregnant women they give much more, but they give it as folic acid. So it's not quite the same as what you'd get from the, the foliage of a, ve a green leafy vegetable, uh, but it's close. Um, the, if you could, you'd much rather get it from foods because you don't have to convert it to use it. Choline. Which you said was turned on by estrogen. Right. So if, would that actually prevent a woman from being pregnant? So it might prevent a woman from getting pregnant. What we know, we don't really know that from studies, because it's hard to study who didn't get pregnant. <laughs> but what we know is, is that in a study in California, in Berkeley, they have strange people there, but probably like, <laughs> probably like Kannapolis or North Carolina. In Berkeley, women who were in the lowest quarter of the, pop, of the women for their choline intake had four times the risk of having a baby with a birth defect, and they looked at cleft palate. Women in the highest group, compared to women in the highest group, okay? So, so there was a big difference in birth defects. And then there's a very interesting study out of Boston, the VIVA study, I'm working with them right now. They took women and, measured, and asked them what they ate while they were pregnant, and the seven years later brought back their children and tested their IQ and other tests. And what they found was is that if the mother had higher choline intake during the first and second trimester of pregnancy, her seven-year-old performed significantly better on some kinds of memory testing than the other children. And so that, that was out of Harvard School of Public Health. I am collaborating with them now because I suspect that the, chi the ch children and women who were sensitive to choline during pregnancy are the ones with this spelling difference so they can't make their own. And so my guess is instead of a 10% improvement they found in the whole group, there's probably a much bigger improvement in the women who can't make their own and no improvement in the ones who could make their own so that it's a subset of all the women who cared about choline during pregnancy. They didn't know that, but they've given me uh, DNA samples from all 800 of the women studied and we're currently analyzing them and should know that in the next few months. That would mean we could predict who's going to get memory enhancement or better brains uh, better. So, 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 <laughs> So I, there are a lot of re so getting pregnant. The question is so whether 
uh, look, if, if very low choline might make you less likely to get pregnant, uh, probably not to conceive, but probably to hold the baby and not lose the baby. Now remember, many women miscarry without ever knowing they miscarried because it was very early during pregnancy, so it's hard to, to know. Um, we've identified another spelling error in men, um, again in choline metabolism. If they, it, if they have it, their sperm can't swim. <laughs> and in Kannapolis, um, it was 5% of the people, in, the volunteers in our center, men who had that. So their sperm swim poorly. And if we give them that nutrient that they can't make themselves, the sperm begins swimming better again. So it may be that there are some infertile couples who have that specific problem in the man, and we might find more spelling differences like that that have to do with whether you get pregnant or not. That's the one that's the best developed and published so far. Yes? Yeah. So, so the question was is uh, that she's told her brother to eat more choline, and he then sent back from the Harvard Health letter saying eating too much choline might be bad for you. So that, let, let's start out. Where, how do you figure out what foods contain choline? Because you, know, you can find in a wide variety of foods, and the USDA, working with our center, has developed the choline content of more than 3,000 foods. And if you Google USDA choline, you'll find the, their website that lets you look up any food and it'll tell you the total choline in the food. Okay, and that's what everybody uses right now. Now your next question is, could co too much choline be bad for you? There's a group out of Cincinnati who says that this metabolite of choline called TMAO causes heart disease and atherosclerosis. And their evidence is, is that they took a lot of people who had heart attacks and heart events and measured their TMAO and found that it's higher in the people who've had atherosclerotic heart disease. The second piece of evidence is they have a mouse and when they give it TMAO, it gets more heart disease. And the problem in my mind with that story is, is that it turns out that choline gets broken down by your gut bacteria to make TMA. That's absorbed and your liver makes TMAO. So it does come from choline. Fish contain a ton of TMA and TMAO. That's, as a matter of fact, the smell of fish is trimethylamine. That's the smell that you recognize as less than fresh fish. <laughs> and so eating fish gives you just as much TMA as eating choline does, and yet every study that's, ever, that's been published in the world is eating fish is, reduces your risk for heart attacks. So that's something hard to explain if TMAO causes heart attack. Second, TMAO is removed from your body by the kidney. You pee it out. And nobody has atherosclerosis of the heart without having atherosclerosis of the kidney. And in fact, if you go back to the published papers in the New England Journal where they argued people with heart attacks have more TMAO, they also had worse kidney function. So the question is, is TMAO just a marker of having kidney problems? And therefore, it's going to be associated with heart disease because they're both caused by the same thing. Or is TMAO the cause? So the only evidence that it could be the cause are those mouse experiments. And they're in a very peculiar mouse <laughs> that has to be genetically manipulated in order to let it get heart disease. And when they try it in any other mouse, it doesn't do anything. So the question is, is it something specific to that mouse or not? So I think it's a question that's up there. And so that, I think it would be prudent not to overload yourself with choline. But half a gram a day is about the recommended amount. 
And so I think half a gram a day is fine, and your brother should try to get half a gram a day in his diet, but not five grams a day or two grams a day, right? So everybody who takes supplements thinks more is better, and here's an example where more may not be better, so why not stay with the amount you need, half a gram, 500 milligrams is what's recommended, about 550 in a man, 450 in a woman, 500 in a pregnant woman, 550 in a lactating woman, so right around half a gram. Yes? Say that so again? Is there something you're supposed to take with the choline to make it work or keep it from not? No, I, 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 so I wouldn't take choline straight because your gut bacteria are going to break it down, you're going to smell like a fish. <laughs> so if I took a supplement, I'd take probably phosphatidylcholine because it isn't as susceptible to that. But even better is I'd eat it in foods. One egg contains about 200 milligrams of choline, depending on how big it is. So if you need half a gram, two eggs is almost there. And uh, you can get it from meat. So I would look at the USDA chart and see what foods, and I would just say, don't go nuts on a diet, especially if you're going to get pregnant, that contains you know, nothing uh, sensible. Um, uh, you know, uh, my daughter is a pastatarian. And I don't, I think vegetarian probably over thousands of years has come up with beans and other foods that contain choline and are, that's why they still have good babies. But a pastatarian who eats, you know, pizza and <laughs> pasta <laughs> may not, may, may not be getting that. And so I think those are the, and if you think about it, many 14, 15, 16 year olds, that's the kind of vegetarian they are. It's not that they're following the rules and doing it carefully. They're eating what they like and not eating the stuff they don't like. So there, I think it may be a problem. So I think the best thing to do is if you're going to be pregnant, I would not take a, a very strange diet during pregnancy. I would try to include everything. Eggs aren't going to give you a heart attack and cholesterol during pregnancy. I don't think you should eat 10 eggs a day, but I think if you ate, you know, three or four eggs a week, you're going to be fine. And if you eat cheesecake, you get six eggs in one portion. You know. <laughs> yeah. For fatty liver? So. Um, yeah. So 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 for fatty liver, we're actually working on that. We have a patent filed by the university and are spinning out a small company to see if we can develop a, a shake that contains all of the things that the people who have these gene misspellings, the 20% of the population, has to, to lower their fatty liver. And we're about to, we're, we're hoping to take that to clinical trial if we can get that company funded. Otherwise, we'll go do it through the NIH in a grant. But one purpose of this campus was to help build the economy of this region. And so what we're trying to say is where does our intellectual capital, the ideas that we generate here, where could it form interesting companies? And so this is one of the early ones we're trying to spin out. If, you know, it's harder than in the triangle because in the research triangle there's lots of venture capital and people spinning out little companies. While in the Charlotte region, if it isn't software, they don't know anything about it. It's just, so we're trying to get them used to life sciences. But those ideas and other ideas, we're hoping to be able to spin out and create small companies that then build this economy down here. And that's the whole idea of this big experiment. And Castle and Cook has been helping by trying to create some incubator facilities for small companies to come in and get started with. So part of the idea is to take some of these intriguing ideas and say, how could you make a company out of it, as opposed to what I used to always do is, how do I publish it and then forget about it once it's published, let somebody else make a company out of it, right? Mm -hmm. Yes? Until a drink comes, what should a person do? <laughs> well, right now, obviously, if you lose body weight, the fatty liver will recede. And I think that if you, uh, right now, I would make sure my diet contained a reasonable f half a gram of choline a day or so. In the U.S., we have a National Health and Nutrition Survey done by the CDC every five years. In the last five-year study, uh, only 7% of women 
achieved the recommended intake for choline. And 93% fell below, with the lowest <coughs> pop quarter of the population taking about half as much as recommended. So there's many people eating less. Why? Because we as nutrition scientists and clinicians in the 1970s, 80s, and 90s told everybody stay away from eggs and meat and it's bad for your cholesterol. All those things made the population eat much less choline. And so now we're seeing the outcome of doing that. Yes? But they have the egg whites. It's all in the yolk, unfortunately. <laughs> So choline is only in the yolk. Because again, if you think about it, the yolk is there to nourish that fetal chicken and grow it. It contains all the nutrients that that fetus needs to grow. So it's in the yolk. The white has none of it. So that's the, so I think it's a, it's a sort of a problem we created by, by thinking we were doing good. We probably were, but it had consequences for the southern nutrient. Yes? Yes. So in 1998, the Institute of Medicine set a requirement for choline for the first time based in good part on the data we generated. That recommended amount. The Food and Drug Administration last year uh, uh, agreed to, to for food labeling, and so now they're asking for foods to be labeled at what percent of the recommended daily intake of choline does the food contain. So that was approved this year by the FDA, and so we're going to see new food labeling laws coming out. Infant formulas, some of the infant formulas contained half as much choline as is present in breast milk, human breast milk, and in 2007 all the large commercial infant formula companies normalized the choline content of their infant formula to match human breast milk. And before that, if you ate a soy-based formula, you might not, you might have had half as much. So if you can't find your way to the parking garage at the airport, you probably had that formula or your mother didn't eat choline. <laughs> yes? So it, it's interesting, we're just putting in a grant proposal to the National Institute of Health to study uh, a form of autism that occurs in women called Rett syndrome. Um, there's been a set of papers suggesting that uh, prenatal nutrition, postnatal nutrition can mitigate, reduce some of the deficits seen in that. And we published a paper last year that the layering, that the formation of the brain cortex, the higher thinking part of the brain, is dramatically affected by the availability of some nutrients very early in pregnancy. And so we're starting to ask, can we apply that to one form of autism? And we chose that one because it's known to be caused by a specific gene mutation, so it's, easy, it's not so variable. Is there anything that, uh, as a yeah. I don't know yet, I, because we haven't conducted those studies, and, but I, you know, one day maybe we will be able to give you an answer. I have a question there. So 20 years down the road, 10 years down the road, whatever the right time frame is, you know my DNA, you know where the misspellings are, can I, given the age that I am, can my doctor say to me, take this and put it in your smoothie, yeah. More, yes, I, th I think they may, but more likely, so the question was in, in, when this is all up and running and you have this test, I think more likely your doctor will say, look, you have problems in these areas, folate, and hopefully they say, you know, you need to eat this kind of food more, and then if you can't do that, they'll say you should take a folic acid supplement. And 
again, you, the problem is you're probably going to have 50 things to recommend, so it'll probably be a more complicated prescription. <coughs> but j just like knowing you're at risk for a disease might make you more serious about following the instructions, knowing your genes make you inefficient in a path should make you more serious about worrying about those things and not worrying about the million other things that people tell you to do that you don't have any special risk for. So you can imagine if, if uh, uh, you're, a, you're a woman who has the ability to make your own choline, you should eat some choline during pregnancy, but you don't have to worry so much about it. Well, if you have the half of the women who can't do that, then you better pay more attention during pregnancy, right? So that's the kind of thing where you'll have uh, sort of more targeted, individualized advice. And I think it'll be done by a computer program because no doctor or dietitian will be able to keep it all in their head. So they'll put your gene code in and out it'll spit all the areas that it recognizes that you have a problem in. And we, the program that one of our faculty are working on spits out recipes as well. Uh, yes. Stress, the impact, the effect of stress on all of these things, um, talk about that. So I was asked about the effect of stress on metabolism. So uh, clearly, for instance, um, when you get stressed, you make a hormone called epinephrine. And epinephrine affects how you metabolize glucose releases glucose from liver stores, for instance, and makes you more prone to have hyperglycemia, et cetera. And so if you're, have, everything else is okay, you can handle that and bring the sugar down by releasing a little more insulin. But if you don't, it becomes a problem for you. So stress uh, hurts there. Um, we, we have a number of investigators sitting over there who I could punt to about cancer and the role of folic acid, let's say, in, in, under the stress of having a cancer. The, the folic acid appears to be important for the cancer's ability to meta metastasize and that more folic acid there makes the cancer more readily ready to metastasize. So there may be a case where you want to not be eating so much if you had a metastatic cancer. But then again, who knows? To continue that question, yeah. though, if you're finding that genetically you need more choline or more um, folate, mm. and you are under, you know, you're a type A person, high anxiety, mm. blah, 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 you're not going to be able to digest and assimilate the choline and the folate. I don't know. So Maybe. How, I wonder how I, I think probably, I don't know that it would affect your ability to absorb or metabolize there, but again, I guess if you get the runs, when you get, you might not, you might need more because you're losing it out the, the other end. Good dinner conversation. We have somebody. <laughs> yes, sir. Yeah, so, so this is why, why do children become allergic to peanuts or the other one to tree nuts? Um, so there's some, in the end what has to happen is, is that the, some component of the peanut or tree nut serves to activate a kind of immune cell called a lymphocyte. And then that memory is retained. So that's, you become allergic to something, you've trained a type of cell that when it sees that invader to suddenly come out and mount an immune response that you see as an allergic attack. Um, so you, it, you either have to have a gut that's a little leaky early in life and you're offered those early and so the antigen gets in and the lymphocyte reacts to it. That would be one reason. Um, Fascinating research says that if you're born living dirty on a farm and eating dirt and seeing a lot of animals, your chances of becoming allergic to things like peanuts and other things is much reduced. So early in life you get, and, and so one of the theories is, is by being too clean um, and you know too worried about being clean, we've got our kids 
not getting that normal desensitization that they get from being exposed to everything and lymphocytes sort of get tuned down like we are now for crazy remarks from <laughs> candidates. Um, you know, so, so I think you get a, you know, you can get tolerant and so one of the theories is, is that we've been too clean and uh, by being so fastidious we've lost the natural sort of protection against developing these kind of allergies and that's why peanut allergies are becoming so much more common. I don't, that's a theory, you know, it's an interesting one. Time's up? Okay. Okay. So I, I'm told, my, I've talked too long. I'm happy to talk to you afterwards. It's a pleasure to have you all here. I hope you had a good time. And um, Brooke, do you know when the next one is? So October 18th is the next one, and you can look at for who's speaking and what it's about. I, oh, so that'll be Steve Hursting talking about nutrition and cancer, which is what his specialty is. So you'll enjoy that. So we try to do these. Why are we doing them? We'd like you to become involved with our center, appreciate what we're doing. Our chance of being a world-class great center really depends on you being involved with us, helping volunteer for our studies, um, giving us uh, some philanthropy that helps us to recruit these great professors, um, talking to your local representatives and telling them you're so happy they gave us a budget to the, to the university. All of those things are what really make us, give us the opportunity to be world class and continue to do this kind of work and compete for outside money. We right now are bringing in about five, six million a year in from federal grants and other sources, uh, but, uh, you know, uh, the state budget to the that the university gives us, which comes from your legislators, uh, is really important, and one of the most important things you can do when you see those legislators is say they did a good thing, because then they, they won't give it to somebody else. <laughs> so thank you. Thank you.